All right. We're going to continue in the book of Zechariah. Uh, we're in <clears throat> the dream visions of Zechariah. And I'm not, I'm not sure if this is the sixth or seventh vision. Uh, well, it's, it's two visions in chapter five. So I hadn't been counting. So I'm not even going to try. But man, we've seen some strange stuff, haven't we? Like, I mean, you, you think about your own dreams and there, this stuff sometimes just doesn't make sense, you know? These are visions from God, so they, they do make sense, though we have a hard time in, in interpreting them in our modern context. But uh, there's been some strange, strange things. Uh, and the dreams uh, that we're going to see, there's two of them in chapter 5, they're going to get a lot stranger. <laughs> Uh, this is perhaps, in my opinion, it's probably the strangest two dreams that we see in Zechariah. Um, but uh, it, it, it's a prophecy for the people, and I hold to, I hold firmly to the fact, you know, that Second uh, Timothy three fifteen said, "All scriptures God breathed; it is it is profitable. It's profitable for rebuke and uh, correction, instruction, training in righteousness." So tonight will be. That as well. It is the Word of God. And so we will do our best to um, uh, interpret it as such, using the Bible as our, as our guide, our key, I guess you could say. Chapter 3 and 4 were visions focused on two men. Do you remember their names? Joshua? And, huh? Zerubbabel. Yeah. Zerubbabel. I didn't want to name any of my kids Zerubbabel, yeah. but I did want to name my first one Buford, and my wife vetoed it. <laughs> I always wanted a Buford. Buford T. Vallada. And what were their positions, Joshua and Zerubbabel? Governor and high priest. Governor and high priest. Absolutely. Absolutely. So tonight in chapter 5, the two visions we'll look at in chapter 5 are going to uh, those two visions in three and four kind of focused on those two men. The two visions in chapter five are going to back up again and focus on the people in general, uh, pointed toward the people as a whole. And the first vision will remind them that God is holy. And if they are to return to God, as Zechariah has said, the very first chapter, return to me and I will return to you. Um, if they're to return to God as his people, they must return to obedience to the covenant law. And failure to do so, we're going to see, will result in destruction. And the second vision, the second half of chapter 5, <clears throat> it's only 11 verses, so it's not going to take us long tonight. Uh, second vision is God's pronouncement that he will remove the sin from the land. Now, <clears throat> It, it, it might sound pretty similar, really, to the vision of God taking the sin of the high priest, taking the sin of Joshua in chapter 3 when he pulled off the dirty clothes and he put on the, uh, the fair garments and all, all those things. Um, but the issue here, and this is kind of important, the issue here is I don't think, and this is, uh, I'm going to give you a lot of opinions tonight, so feel free to push back on them and we can discuss them. Uh, the issue here is not the state of sin in the sense that you can't come to me, y'all are all defiled. Uh, that issue was taken care of in chapter 3 when the stain was removed, the clothes were good, and now they have a high priest that is holy before God who will be their representative. The issue here is their unrepentance and their continual practice of sin, even in the community as they're rebuilding the temple during the time of uh, Zechariah. He's talking to people that are persistent in their sin. Now, these visions are really, really strange. And there are parts that we're going to have to, I'm going to have to admit, you know, I can't be sure what this uh, means. But the overall point of both visions are pretty easy to discern. So the first one is return to me by obeying the covenant law. And the second one is God declares I'm going to remove the sin from the land. So let's look at the first one. We're going to read verses 1 through 4, which is the first vision. And then we're going to go back and go verse by verse like we normally do. Then we'll read 5 through 11 and do the same thing. Okay? Sound good? Sure. All right. 1 through 4. 
Again, I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, a flying scroll. And he said to me, what do you see? I answered, I see a flying scroll. Its length is 20 cubits, and it's with 10 cubits. Then he said to me, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole land, for everyone who steals shall be cleaned out according to what is on one side of the scroll, and everyone who swears falsely shall be cleaned out according to what is on the other side. So there's writing on both sides of the scroll. Um, And then in verse 4 it says, I will send it out, the curse, declares the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter the house of the thief. And the house of him who swears falsely by my name. That's important. It's not just telling a lie. It's swearing falsely by God's name. And it shall remain in his house and consume it, both timber and stones. That's the first vision. So admittedly, a flying scroll is a strange picture. But it isn't hard for us to interpret because of how the angel describes it. He tells us it's, it's God's curse and it's against the thieves and the, those who swear falsely by God's name. Um, so the first thing he does in verse 1 and 2 is gives us just the description. You know, the, the lifted my eyes, saw a flying scroll. What is it you see? It's a flying scroll and its length is 20 cubits and its width is 10 cubits. The scroll is obviously unrolled. Uh, Because he can see the length and the width of it. You know what I'm talking about, like a scroll, right? It's like a long, you know, okay. 20 cubits by 10 cubits is how long? 30 feet. 15 wide. wide. Did you just know that or you have a study Bible? Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's translated 30 feet, yeah. That's correct. Cubit is roughly 18 inches. It was measured by the end of your elbow to the top of your finger. Uh, So yeah, 30 foot scroll. And 30 foot scroll is is long. Uh, But there are scrolls found that are 20 feet long. You know, Isaiah scroll and things like that. But what is really weird is this this scroll is 15 feet wide. I mean, this is, it would amount to like a flying billboard. You know, just flying through the land, you know. And and there are a lot of theories as to why it's so big. Um, We can't know for sure. But I'll tell you what I think. Some people say that it's so big so it could not be missed. And it could be easily read by anybody um, in the vision. Uh, Some point to the fact that the holy place of the tabernacle was 30 foot by 15 foot. Now, when I say the holy place, I'm talking about not the courtyard, not the holy of holies, but that first room where the priests, you know, and the the showbread, that was 30 foot by 15 feet. And a lot of people attach significance to the fact that, you know, that was where, that was where, you know, God's ministry took place and all that. I used to be in that camp and tie great significance to that, but I don't, I don't know that I am anymore. Um, so I have a hard time putting, the, putting that into, they're building the temple, but the, the temple wasn't those dimensions. It was the tabernacle that those dimensions. And so I think I land in the camp that it was just a big old scroll because it is for everybody and it's for everybody to read. Is there any other, any other ideas? Nobody can be sure why it's so big. All we have is theories. What do you think? Large print, just so everybody can read it. Yeah, it's not going to be missed. It's not going to be missed. Yes. <clears throat> That's true. No one can ignore it. I mean, you see a 30-foot flying scroll, it's going to grab your attention. Um, regardless of whether or not the size has significance other than just being big and being in your face and able, able to read, we're told what the scroll is. In verse 3, He says, this is the curse that goes out over the face of the whole land for everyone who steals shall be cleaned out according to what is on one side of the scroll. Everyone who swears falsely shall be cleaned out according to what is on the other side. So we're told, the angel tells, he interprets it for us. This flying scroll is the curse that goes out over the whole land. Um, it publicly proclaims God's condemnation on the people's sins and specifically noted here is the sin of stealing and the sin of swearing falsely in the next verse saying by my name. 
Um, and those sins, which the scroll seems to focus on here in, in this vision, um, why do you think he specifies these sins? There's a couple of different theories about this too. Because I think he was sending a message that he was going to clean out their sins and they were going to be for sure. I agree with that 100%. That's the overarching message, message is there's going to be a curse for you, who, uh, for, you, for you who sin, and I'm sending it out over the whole land. But why these two? Why not idolatry? Why not... Uh, Sure, sure. Yep, they were not following him. They were not obedient. At least some were. He says, everyone who steals. He doesn't say everyone is cursed. He's, it's, it's a specific target that this curse is going to. Um, there are really two going theories that, to be quite honest, both, I, either one could be true, and I don't know. Um, the w first theory is that these particular sins were rampant during the time the people were uh, rebuilding the temple. So you imagine, you, know, you imagine how many of y'all have been on like mission trip where things are just destroyed and you go in to try to help clean up. What's going on? I mean, people are taking all the stuff, you know, they're looting. <clears throat> and swearing falsely by his name, you know, there's, the temple's not built yet. There's no... Uh, technically, there's no worship the way he's commanded to worship. And so I honestly don't know if that's true. Uh, several commentators say that that is true, but I was unable to find any kind of source documentation of that going on. Um, the other theory is that uh, when you take swears falsely by my name, um, that's a breach of the third commandment. And the, the lying is the breach of the Eighth Commandment. And those two commandments stand for the whole of the Ten Commandments. Uh, so the two tables of the law. One, love God, which means you know, no idols, no images. I'm, I'm God, no one before me. Don't take my name in vain. And the other table was love your neighbor. You know, no murder, no stealing, no lying, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, that could be true too, but... The question I had all week long was, why those two? You know, why? How, show me somewhere in Scripture where those two represent. Um, so, and, and they very well could. I just don't know. I just don't know. Um, but you could extrapolate the principle uh, to understand that God is confronting sin. So we, we can say that for sure. Um, and the two sins that he is confronting, even if you take swears falsely and forget the by my name, which is to take his name in vain and just say lying, those two sins are part of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, the covenant that the people agreed to. So you could, you could rightly say um, that he is reestablishing his, um, his uh, covenant law, his covenant law as a people, yes. Yeah, yeah. So he uh, allows study Bible says that it uh, those two commands breached the two tables of the law: love God, love your neighbor. Um, one of the one of the commentators I found her name is Joyce Baldwin. Uh, she said that uh, everyone who steals is a pithy way of saying everyone who wrongs his neighbor, and everyone who swears falsely invoking the divine name sums up blatant disregard for God's holiness. Um, so if you pushed me in a corner, I would probably, I would probably take that view um, because of all of what's going on. You know, God says, return to me and I'll return to you at the very beginning of Zechariah. And he's rebuilding the temple, so they're going to reestablish the sacrifices. They're going to reestablish the worship. They're going to reestablish all, all, this, all the system of, of the old covenant that was gone when they went into exile. 
Um, and so what he's doing is he's telling them, you know, building that temple is good and I want you to do it. And I'm commanding you to do it and I'm going to clean your priest for you so he can stand in there for you. But you're going to have to turn back to my covenant law. I mean, if we're going to reinstate this covenant, y'all are coming back to the land. You're going to have to turn back to my covenant law. Um, regardless of which view you hold about what those two particular sins um, intend, uh, the point is that God's covenant law brings either covenant blessings or covenant curses. He said that on Mount Ebal and on, on Mount uh, the other one uh, at the, in, in Deuteronomy when, or was it Deuteronomy? Might have been Exodus where he said he pronounced, no, no it was Exodus, <laughs> Exodus 28, 29. He, uh, he said, uh, pronounced all the covenant blessings. And they said, we will do the covenant. And he pronounced all the covenant curses. And uh, they said, we will do the covenant. So God is reaffirming his covenant commands, making sure that people understand sin will not go unpunished. The scroll and the pronouncement of God's judgment and the scroll is big enough that everyone can see it. And it's flying so it can cover the whole land. There's nobody exempt from it. Um, and then we're shown that there is nowhere to hide from this curse that God, I believe it's the covenant curse that was announced in Exodus, but this curse that God is sending on these. He says, I will send it out, declares the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter the house of the thief and the house of him who swears falsely by my name, and it shall remain in his house. The curse shall remain in his house and consume it. <clears throat> and when he means consume it, he obviously means it will destroy it because he says both timber and stone. So he's not, not just talking about your household. He's talking about your place in the land, your place in the returned exiles. He says judgment is going to enter the home of those who break the covenant law and destroy their homes. Nowhere in the land is beyond his reach. So even if justice was not done. You know, remember, there's a lot of transition going on right here. A lot of, a lot of rebuilding going on right here. So presumably, I, this is just a guess. This is, I have no documentation for this. But, you know, if the courts are, are unable to get justice when sin is done in secret or someone steals and there's no proof, God himself is saying, I'm going to send a curse and I'm going to punish wrongdoing. Uh, this is God's intention to to root out and eradicate covenant breakers from the community. And it's written on a billboard for everyone to see. Now, yes. <coughs> Sorry. I hadn't thought of that. That may be true. So before Zechariah started prophesying, Haggai prophesied about you guys have turned away from building the temple and you've started building your own houses. Uh, so maybe, maybe they valued their own houses still and, and God is saying, I'm going to destroy what you, what you value most. Um, the second vision, he's going to say, I'm, I'm, I'm going to remove this sin. And the sin could be sin, but it also could be sinner. He, he's saying, I'm going to purify my people. I'm going to purify them in land. But make sure you understand here, like that sounds really harsh. But this was the covenant God made with Israel. This was the covenant they agreed to. God is just saying, listen, it's been 70 years. Actually, it's been 90 years because they've been building for 20 years. Uh, we're setting all this stuff back up. You, you better remember the covenant. You know, you better remember that covenant that I made with you. Um, and it isn't describing, I, I think, um, in my, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, but in my limited study of some of the words that I needed to define, um, I don't think he's describing judgment and curse coming upon a person because they, they lied once or because they stole once. He, he, call, he says this is, this is who they are, the house of the thief. You know, he's not, not just saying, you know, you break my law once and I'm going to crush your house. You know, he, he's talking about those who are living, uh, they're hiding in Israel and they're hiding in this restored land and they're, they're not turned back to God. They're still doing all the practices that got them exiled in the first place. 
Uh, and God is telling them, I'm going to bring judgment upon those who reject God's law, my law, he would say, and, and the covenant. Um, God is showing that the restoration of the community of God is not just about building this temple and reinstating those sacrifices. That's part of it, and God commanded them to do it. It's about their hearts turning back to God in repentance and faith, just as Zechariah said at the very beginning, turn to me and I will turn to you. Um, it's just like we learned Sunday from Hebrews and many other passages in the Old Testament. God desires obedience, not sacrifices. You can't think we're going to rebuild this temple and just start sacrificing oxen so it don't matter if I steal. It doesn't matter if I swear falsely. It doesn't matter if I live immorally according to God's law. Um, God desires the obedience of his people. So he's warning them. He's warning them not to fall back into the same lifestyle and practices that caused you to go into exile in the first place. Y'all with me? <clears throat> what does the message of this first vision say to us in our modern context? Now, we're not building a temple. We're certainly sacrificing no animals. We've got a once-for-all sacrifice. And if you're in Jesus, there is no curse. But we're not exempt from sin. Right. Yes. Because God cannot be in fellowship with us if we remain in sin. So I think we should take this as a warning ourselves. I think so too. That we need to be more, more careful with how we act, how we speak, what we do, because it does, it does. And it, it will bring judgment. God will, God will deal with us one way or another. For sure. We'll get to the passage in Hebrews eventually that says. Those that he loves, he chastises. Right. And he will, not let you, he will not let you go off into sin in, uh, indefinitely. He will bring you back. Uh, and a lot of times it's very painful. In fact, Hebrews says that. He says discipline for a time doesn't feel good. You know, and it's not, it's not fun. Uh, but he disciplines those, he, the, those that he loves. Any other thoughts about modern application for us? Yes. Hmm. So she said that her Bible said that in the future Israel, God will send out his judgment and remove every sinner from the land. Now, we know that to be true, too, don't we? Like the new heavens, new earth. There won't be no there won't be no sin. There won't be no there won't be uh, there won't be no there won't be any. Uh, there won't be any defiling thing. There won't be any curse. There won't be any. He will remove them from the land. Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Any other comments? You sure? All right. So then we come. Uh, I was stalling because I don't, I don't like this vision. I mean, not that I don't like it, but it's just difficult. We come to the second vision. <clears throat> Same thing. I'm going to read all of it. And then we'll back up and do it again. So it says, Then the angel who talked with me came forward and said to me, Lift your eyes and see what is that, what this is, see what this is that is going out. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Make sure you see that at the beginning. At the very beginning, he tells us it's leaving. And I said, What is it? He said, This is the basket that is going out. And he said, this is their iniquity in all the land. I know some of your translations say something different. We'll get to that. And behold, the leaden cover, a, a lead cover was lifted, and there was a woman sitting in the basket. And he said, this is wickedness. And he thrust her back into the basket and thrust down the leaden weight on its opening. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, two women coming forward. The wind was in their wings. They had wings like the wings of a stork, 
and they lifted up the basket between heaven and earth. Then I said uh, to the angel who talked with me, where are they taking the basket? He said to me, to the land of Shinar, to build a house for it. Some of your translations may say a temple for it. And when this is prepared, they will set the basket down there on its base. Once again, very, very strange. Here is a vision over, overarching. It's not hard to discern. He says it's wickedness and we're taking it away. You know, he says there's a vision of God removing the, the sin. Some say even the sinner from the land because his covenant people are there and casting it away. So let's start at five and six. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it says, uh, lift up your eyes and see what you see. What is it? He says a basket that's going out. And he says, the end of verse 6 says, this is their iniquity in all the land. So verse 5, we're told that he sees a basket that's leaving. It's going out. So right at the beginning, he tells us it's being removed. Uh, the word basket here is actually the word ephah. Have you heard that word before? You have. In Ruth, uh, so many ephahs of grain. Uh, so some of your translations may say a measuring basket. Does any of your, does any of your translations say that? Because yeah. an ephah was used to measure and store grain. Um, a normal ephah was, um, it could be anywhere. It could, there's lots of different thoughts about it. It could be anywhere from four and a half gallons to ten gallons. Uh, most say it's about three-fifths of a bushel. I mean, if you're... You know, if that's a uh, measurement you understand. Um, now, the thing about this basket is there's two views about it because some people think it's bigger than normal um, because it's able to accommodate a woman inside, you know. And I don't care how small a woman you are, you ain't going to get in a 10-gallon bucket. Um, but some think it's a regular ephah, and the woman represents like a female idol, uh, of idolatry, a false god that's being taken away. Um, I mean, okay, but all I have is the text, and it says a woman. So I take it just to be an actual woman. Maybe the basket is bigger. Maybe it's just a dream vision, and it's weird, you know? I, I, uh, it's, it's, not meant to, it's not meant to be taken as, well, if a woman's in there, it's got to be a big basket. It's a dream. It's a, it's a vision that the Lord has given. So it, a lot of strange things could go on. We don't, uh, we don't, we don't need to dwell on how it's possible. Um, it's, it's a symbolic dream symbolizing a reality that God is giving Zechariah. And so um, I tend to think it's an actual woman uh, because she tries to, it seems like she tries to get out of the basket uh, and they put the, lever, the angel pushes her back down in, you know. But I don't know. I, so what do y'all think? Like, idolatry is nowhere in here other than the fact that it says we'll take him to Shinar. And some translations say we're going to build a temple for her and put it on its base, which is used a lot for idols. <coughs> Anybody care? Well, it's captured. It's captured, yeah. Yeah, he's going to put, he's going to put a, a, a lid on it for sure. And verse 6 tells us that this basket, we're, we're not told that the woman's inside it yet until 7 and 8. Uh, the basket, he says, is their iniquity. Now, what does your translation say? Appearance. Appearance. You have a New American Standard Bible, right? Amplified. Amplified. I didn't check that one. I agree. You hear what he said? He said, as we read this, the symbolism is more important than the reality. It's more important than... Uh, so, when pro all through the Bible, including Revelation, when there is a prophecy given, there is actual and real fulfillment. So, there is an actual fulfillment... But it doesn't always look like the symbolic things that are used to say that it's coming. So, for instance, when God fulfilled this or will fulfill this, 
uh, I think there was a near fulfillment and a future fulfillment. Um, it's not a real woman in a real basket being carried by storks. You know, it's just a symbol of God taking away the sin of, of the land. Uh, and, you know, so we can talk about that. But I think, I think you're right, Dave. I think it's um, even in Revelation, that prophecy, you know, it uh, describes Satan as a, as a dragon. You know, it doesn't describe what he looks like. It describes what he is like, you know. And so um, we have to read the prophetic genre the way it was intended by the, by the author. Um, one translation said this is their appearance. Uh, the NET said this is their eye. Um, and most other translations say this is their iniquity in all of the land. Now, I'm going to show you something that you may not care nothing about. It's pretty interesting to me. The difference, the, the word in, in the Masoretic text, the kind of the, the basic Hebrew text that is used... Um, is I. It is I. Uh, it was changed to iniquity in the Greek translation of the Old Testament because the difference between the word in this form, I, and iniquity, is a single stroke of the pen. So this is the two words. Avanam is, it, we read Hebrew right to left, not left to right. So Avanam is uh, the first that word on that, that side, and it means, it means iniquity. Uh, um, anam is the second word on this side, and it means I. And so if you were looking at the Hebrew Bible, it says I. That, that is there. Um, but many of the translations, English translations, follow the Greek translation of the Old Testament because you see the difference so there's a, there's a vav right there. It's a, it's a V or a W, that straight line with a curve on it. And this is a yod, which is a, a Y sound. And the only difference is a stroke of the pen going down. And so the translator of the Septuagint, the Greek Old Testament, um, he translated it as avanam, assuming that it was supposed to be iniquity. So there is a raging debate about whether it's I or iniquity. So if you read the verse, if we back up and look at it, it says, this is their eye in all the land, or this is their iniquity in all the land. New American Standard, and I guess the Amplified, take eye and use it as appearance. This is their appearance. This is what they look like. Um, even if it is eye, and when I looked at the actual text, the Masoretic text of the Hebrew, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, and I, I have a hard time reading it. But it says I. I looked at three or four different uh, texts to make sure that it wasn't just one or two. They all say I. <clears throat> and so the only one that, that doesn't is the, the Septu Septuagint, the, the Greek Old Testament. Uh, even if it is I, Hebrew uses the picture of an I in a lot of different ways. You know, an evil I, uh, you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. So those who take this as I, or uh, they say that since God's, I, and we've seen I, all eyes, all the way through Zechariah several times. Uh, so it's not completely out of nowhere. Uh, God's eye speaks of his all seeing, his all knowing, you know, those things. Uh, and they say, well, this is the evil demonic opposite of that uh, because he says this is it's wickedness and he's sending this back, uh, basket away. Personally, I think iniquity fits the context better, and that's probably why the translator translated it this way, because there's just a, you know, a single handwritten stroke of the pen, is, that's all it would take. Um, but either way, he's talking about something bad. Can we agree on that? Yes. Okay. Um, but I has a lot to commend it to it, because we've seen eyes in like the last three visions. So either way... The next verse makes clear what we're talking about is something bad, whether it's eye or iniquity or appearance. Because he says, and behold, the leaden cover was lifted and there was a woman sitting in the basket. And he said, this is wickedness. There's no ambiguity about that translation. And he thrust her back into the basket. So obviously she's trying to get out. And he thrust down the leaden weight on its opening. There is no historical data anywhere that I could find about lead covers on 
ephah baskets of any kind. Uh, so I'm thinking maybe this is to keep her in, you know. Um, it's not real clear whether the angel means that the woman herself represents wickedness or her and the basket represent wickedness. Um, I'm just not sure. I'm just not sure. But we do know it represents wickedness. So what, what I said at the beginning, and, and all of this that I'm telling you, it's not to confuse you and say we don't know what the Bible says. If you back up and look at the big picture, even though you don't understand what I, the I is talking about, and we don't understand what, you know, why these women have stork wings, and we don't, you know, even if you don't understand that, you can see the point of the vision. I am getting rid of wickedness out of this land. That's really the point that we hold on to. Now, one more corrective that I want to give you before we move on. There are many, many flights of fancy about why he would see a woman portrayed as wickedness. Don't answer, guys. There have been, throughout history, there have been many sermons, uh, like through Christian history, preached touting all kinds of ideas about why a woman is seen as the personification of wickedness. Most of them are pretty stupid. So do you know why it's a woman that's pictured as wickedness and not a man? I know you don't, because I'm going to tell you. It's a, very, it's a very deep theological significance here, so stay with me. In Hebrew, the word wickedness is feminine. That's why. It wouldn't be, it, the grammar would be all messed up if it was pictured as anything else other than a feminine thing because wickedness in the Hebrew is, a, it's like, you know, Spanish, Latin. They have, they have masculine, feminine, neuter forms of words. That's why. So uh, he, in just a moment, we're going to see two presumably women with stork wings sent from God to bring this basket out of here. So it has nothing to do with gender or anything like that. It has to do with grammar. The wickedness is feminine words, so he used a feminine, so he used a feminine picture to show it. Um, as the basket is opened, it looked like you know she's trying to get out, and we're told that the angel thrusts her back down in the basket, put a lead weight on it, presumably so she can't get out. What do you think is symbolized by that? And like I said, we're, we're just uh, we're, we're just sharing our opinions tonight. <clears throat> this woman is wickedness in this basket. Lid is removed, so they see her, and they say, this is wickedness, and then the angel thrusts her back into the basket and puts a lead weight over the top of it. What's, what do you think symbolized? What, I mean, just guess. If I see the snake in the basket, I'm going to put a lid on it. <laughs> if you've seen a snake in a basket, you're going to put a lid on it. Yeah, well... Forget the picture of the woman. This is wickedness. And he is, God is, presumably, this is an angel that did this, right? Uh, and he thrusts her back. Yeah. He's keeping, it, he's keeping it contained, and he's going to remove it from the land. Uh, he's going to keep that under, under lead weight. And as if things aren't strange enough, now we have stork women that are going to come get it. It says, Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, two women coming forward. The wind was in their wings. They had wings like the wings of a stork, and they lifted up the basket between heaven and earth. So, describes these women with wings like a stork. I didn't know this, but I learned this this week that, uh, I mean, it's a com comical picture, you know, you have a stork. You know, why not an eagle? You know, why not something majestic or whatever? But I learned this week that. The stork is, was common in the Near East, and it was known for its long migrations and, and its strong wings. So that may or may not be true. That's just something that I read uh, and what somebody said. So I'm not sure. If that's not true, then I have no idea why they have the wings of a stork. It could be angels that we're looking at here. Uh, that... Uh, Women with stork wings. I, it doesn't say that, but it could be, I guess. Um, although there are not too many, you know, all, all the times angels are uh, referenced in the whole Bible, uh, it's always with masculine pronouns. It's always with masculine verbs. It's always uh, masculine, so this would be a, a one-off. 
Um, and so, I just don't know. All I can tell you for sure, these are God's messengers to remove wickedness out of the land. Simple enough. Questions, comments, cries of outrage. Okay. Last two verses. Then I said to the angel who talked with me, where are they taking the basket? He said to me, to the land of Shinar, to build a house for it. And when this is prepared, they will set the basket down on its base. The angel tells Zechariah, women are taking the basket, the wickedness, to the land of Shinar. You know where the land of Shinar is? Ah, I'm glad y'all knew that. How awesome. Y'all knew that Shinar is Babylon? That's, That's correct. It's another name for Babylon. Shinar was where the people stopped in Genesis 11 and built the Tower of Babel. Uh, Shinar was where, was where one of the kings that Abraham fought was from. Uh, Shinar was where the people are said to have gone into exile. Daniel chapter 1 verse 1 and 2 uh, says that they were in exile in the land of Shinar. 2 Chronicles 36 says the same thing. It's another name for Babylon. But remember, as Zechariah is prophesying... Babylon had been overthrown 20 years earlier by Persia. The point he's making, I think, feel free to push back on it, is that Babylon is used as a symbol for everything that is against God. And it's used that way all through Scripture. Even in Revelation, Babylon is used as a symbolic center of evil and rebellion against God. Uh, And so... Um, the land of Shinar is technically, while Zechariah is prophesying, under Persian rule. Um, and so uh, I think by using that phrase, he's calling back all of, the, all of the things that Shinar represented in the Old Testament before Zechariah. And he's calling to, to, uh, back to remembrance uh, all of the things that Babylon, the... Uh, symbolizes as rebellion against God. And, and the point is that the Lord is taking the sin from the land and he's sending it to its symbolic home. God himself is taking wickedness from the land and sending it to where it belongs. So in the first vision, we see God's covenant curse come upon those who rebel against the covenant law, who live in rebellion against the covenant law. God would remove them, it said, by destroying them and their houses, both timber and stone, And then we see a picture of God's servants taking the wickedness far from the land and setting it in its place. A lot of people see the woman as an idol because of what it says on its base is used several times for where idols sit in their their temples. Um, Earlier in Zechariah chapter 3 verse 9, God said, I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. You remember that? God in his covenant faithfulness will remove the wickedness of the land, cast it as far as the east is from the west. I think that's what he's saying here. So, near fulfillment, far fulfillment, final fulfillment. What are they? Huh? Sin will be removed. Sin will be removed, yeah. I think, <coughs> Sorry. I can't point to a specific near fulfillment other than the temple will be rebuilt. The, the things will go on. You know, they, they will start the sacrifice again. The worship of God will continue again. Um, but there is no time, I don't think, that uh, there was not sin in the land. I mean, you look at Ezra. Nehemiah is the perfect example. He was the last one to come uh, building the walls. And... You read through the book of Nehemiah, he is a quintessential leader, he's a godly man, he's, but he's all the time confronting the people's sin. And the last chapter of Nehemiah, the last section of the last chapter of Nehemiah is basically Nehemiah's prayer to God saying, I did the best I could. You know, they're still sinners, they're still, you know, they're still, doing, he's pulling people's beards out for for, for marrying outside of Israel, even in the last, in the last section of Nehemiah. Um, but we do have a far fulfillment, don't we? God removed the land and the sin of the land in the land in a single day when Jesus. Jesus. You know, uh, he, he, you know, I don't have to go into that. He died on the cross. Sin was removed from his people. 
Um, and there's coming a final fulfillment when sin will be eradicated from this creation. Like, it will be no more. Uh, sin will be, there will be a new heavens, a new earth, and there will be, and it will be all God's doing. It will be all, God, it'll be all God's doing in Christ. It's all God's doing in the salvation Christ brings and the spirit of God that indwells his people. And it will be all God's doing in the second coming when there's a new heaven and a, and a new earth. So, um, knowing this as best we can to see the big picture of what this text is trying to get across to us, even if we don't understand all the details, what is the imperative for us? Like, I'm going to preach a sermon on this text. I mean, I'm, I'm not yet, but I will eventually. But like on a Sunday morning, I'm going to preach Zechariah chapter 5. At the end of the sermon, what is the imperative? Like, what is the, how you respond to God's word? What is it for us, you think? Check your house and see if you're okay with the Lord if you're not returned back to us. Return to the Lord if you're not. For sure. For sure. Anything else? I mean, that's right. Mm -hmm. Give your sin to the Lord. Trust in the, His way of removing your sin. Sure. The message, I think, <clears throat> the message for the original readers was strive for godliness and turn your hearts back to God. Turn your hearts back to the covenant. Turn your hearts back to uh, living for Him. That's the whole message Zechariah has been pushing the whole time. Um, by grace through faith, we're to be cleansed before him. This is a, this is a tough vision, and I knew it was going to be tough. I, it's my, I have a tendency to, I, I want to understand every little single tiny thing in it. And there are some things that somebody can, but I don't have the, I don't have the resources, the ancient Near East resources to, to understand every little detail. But the thing about God's word is, like, even, even, even if, you, if you had no access to any of the things that I told you, you know, that's the Hebrew word that was up there or whatever, you can back up and look at the whole section, verses 1 through 4, and then verses 5 through 11, and you can see the main point of what he's saying. He's saying... Strive for holiness according to my commands in that first section. I'm sending a flying scroll. It's a curse. It's going to tear down your house if you steal and lie and all this stuff. And in the second section, you can see the main point. I'm, God says, I'm going to be the one that takes away sin from my people. So you can see, even when you run into uh, the minor prophets are very, very difficult. Um, and prophetic language, poetry sometimes is difficult. You can still read this without all of the intricate details back up. And what you want is the main point. That's the definition of expository preaching. When the main point of the text is the main point of the sermon. And so um, it's not... It's not um, you, you read this in your quiet time or in your Bible study, and you say, I don't have no clue what's going on. But if you back up and you read it slowly and you see what you do understand, um, I believe the Holy Spirit will bring you to the, the point that he's trying to get across. You may not understand why stork wings are in there and women in baskets and all that stuff, but you can get to the main point, and the, and the Holy Spirit will illuminate that to you. Any questions, comments? <laughs> Okay. Next week is members meeting, so we'll two weeks we'll uh, we'll convene and do Zechariah six. Well, once we get to nine, that's that's some fun stuff there. We get to talk about Alexander the Great and all that stuff. That's enjoyable. Let's pray. God, we do love you. We thank you for your word. <clears throat> God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for thank you for the clarity of your word. Even in first reading, we may not think it's so clear. But, God, you've given to us for instruction, for proof, for correction. And, God, the, the overall message of these two visions is very simple. 
And it is very easy to discern from the vision, even if we don't understand all the elements of the vision. God, we pray that you would help us to read our Bibles prayerfully and depend upon your spirit to show us the point of the text, to show us what it means in our life, to show us what it means in, uh, in the way that you have placed it in your scripture. God, we ask that you would guide us, that you would help us to be faithful. Faithful to your word, faithful to your commands, knowing that our sin has been taken away at the cross. God, we pray that you would help us to be thankful that you have taken sin away. Uh, God, we still practice sin in our lives as we're warring against the flesh. But in our position before you, sin has been removed and it's gone. As far as the east is from the west, God, that, that's something we can be thankful for. Something we have to be thankful for, God. It's the greatest thing in, in the world. Greatest thing in the universe, God, and we thank you for your grace and mercy in giving that gift to us. God, we do love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.